Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the problem was final, the house was empty, and his bow was last, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Why would the Pope engage Sherlock Holmes' services? Why did he receive the Legion of Honor from France? And why would he refuse a knighthood? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 263, On the Scent with Sherlock Holmes, Part 1. Well, hi there, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, <laughs> that's a lovely scent you're wearing today. Oh, thank you. I always favor George Trumper aftershave. <laughs> it's the only Trumper I uh, actually appreciate. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, let, this is a Trifles, and you can reach us in the show notes by going to ihose.co slash trifles263, all lowercase. That'll take you to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com site. You can root around there, look through our old episodes. This is season six that we're on now, second episode, third episode of season six. No, second episode. My gosh, the time <laughs> is going so slowly and yet not at all. It's, it's January, so the molasses are flowing very slowly. Um, we are in the sixth season of this show. We are delving heavily this season into scholarship, and this is going to be one of those episodes, so stay tuned. You should also know that if you become a patron of our show through Patreon, and you can just hit that Patreon button on any of our show notes or simply follow the, follow the link to patreon.com slash trifles, that you will be eligible for a monthly and a quarterly drawing courtesy of our sponsors at the Baker Street Journal. Every month we'll be drawing a random winner to, to receive some back issues of the journal. And every quarter we'll be doing a drawing for a free annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal, which of course includes the Christmas annual. So make sure you become a sponsor, a Patreon uh, sponsor of, uh, I hear of Sherlock, excuse me, of Trifles, uh, today to make sure you are eligible for that. Well, this is the first in a series of uh, a few episodes. I think we're going, how, how many episodes are we going on this topic? Two, three, something like that, uh, yeah. called On the Scent. Two, three, four. Yeah, three, four, five. Who, do I hear $50? <laughs> uh, where we are looking at on the Scent with Sherlock Holmes, which is a book that was published by Gaslight Publications in 1987 by Walter Shepard, On the Scent with Sherlock Holmes. And we thought it would be interesting because when, when you read the Sherlock Holmes stories, certainly Conan Doyle creates a wonderful visual in our minds. He does a, a wonderful job with setting and with dialogue. Sidney Paget and later Frederick Dorr Steele and Arthur Twidle and Frank Wiles and a number of other illustrators have done a marvelous job bringing to life some of these scenes, these signature scenes in the stories that help us to understand exactly what was going on and what they looked like in those uh, areas. And of course, you're here listening to us with your ears. This is an audio program. But we don't really experience the Sherlock Holmes stories with our noses. And yet, to think about Victorian London, there must have been a variety of scents in those days. And we even discover 
that Sherlock Holmes follows his nose in a few cases. So we thought it would be an interesting opportunity for us to look at scents in the canon and to follow Walter Shepard on his journey. So, Bert, I am going to turn it over to you, our resident scholar today, to take us on the scent with Sherlock Holmes. I'm happy to do that, and it's a lovely book. And one of the motivations, Scott, I think that you and I had with this part of the trifles agenda was to bring back some of the scholarship that might not be easy for people to find so that they could enjoy it as much as we do. And this text by Walter Shepard, as you rightly said, was published by Gaslight back in the 80s, but it goes back farther than that. I think it was originally put together in the late 70s. And Shepard, of whom I know very little, in fact, the only thing I know about Walter Shepard is in this book, points out in his introduction that he was a schoolboy in London, he says, from 1916 to 1920, only a few years after Holmes had trapped von Bork. And a lovely thing that he does in this book is to connect the aromas, the experience of being in London in those Victorian days with things going on in the canon. And so he begins with this wonderful scene, of course, the very first murder in which we see Sherlock Holmes involved in a study in Scarlet. And he quotes, Sherlock Holmes approached the body and kneeling down, examined it intently. So swiftly was the examination made that one would hardly have guessed the minuteness with which it was conducted. Finally, he sniffed the dead man's lips. Poison, said Sherlock Holmes curtly and strode off. And what a great place to begin there. You know, this cause of Enoch Drebber's death. And it's the very first mention, Shepard says in the Sherlock Holmes saga, of the practical use of Holmes's thin, hawk-like nose. <laughs> the nose knows. Well, this is interesting to me because I don't know how prevalent it was in Victorian times for individuals, the general public, to understand that poisons typically had some scent about them. Um, and, and this seems to me to be a demonstration straight out of the Joseph Bell textbook, where you could imagine Conan Doyle in medical school in, at the University of Edinburgh, and Dr. Bell coming in, and maybe there is a, a body laid out on the slab in front of the classroom in the amphitheater, and he may look like he is closely examining the body, perhaps with a lens, and his nose might get somewhere near the lips, but it doesn't, it isn't clear to the students that he's sniffing the man's lips. And he would pop up and say, this man died of strychnine poisoning or, you know, arsenic poisoning, whatever it might happen to be. And then to instruct them on the subtleties of poisoning, that maybe there was constriction of some musculature, but there was also a signature odor associated with certain kinds of poisons and toxins. Mm. It's fascinating, isn't it? Mm. And in this, in this episode and in this series, we'll have more of these examples of these individual aromas that provide important bits of evidence to Sherlock Holmes, but we'll also take you out into the streets, into the into the areas of uh, Victorian England to experience what those aromas were like. But going on in the cardboard box, Holmes recognized the smell of coffee on a brown paper wrapping and identified a piece of nautical tarred twine by holding it up to the light and sniffing it. And of course, in the sign of four, he smells the tar-like odor of creosote, which leads to a lovely scene in Sign of the Four. And in the Naval Treaty, he remarks, ah, a scent of tobacco would have been worth a great deal to us in such an investigation. And to your point, um, the use of the nose in examination was advocated by other experts. And there are these anecdotes of Dr. Joe Bell, who also was noted for his hawk-like beak. He was on record. Says Shepard is having identified 
<laughs> a man's occupation solely by smell. And he says, this man is a French polisher. Dr. Bell told his students, come now, can't you smell him? Now, of course, French polish is a method of treating furniture. It has nothing to do with the nationality of the polisher. But that aroma, you know, is very distinctive to Bell. I was going to ask what you polish the French with, but that's um, (laughs) with your French polisher, of course. That's absolutely right. Yeah, mais oui, absolument. And in modern times, now to your other point about, you know, these these great aromas, uh, Shepard recounts how Sir Bernard Spilsbury, who was a – Shepard describes as the consultant to Scotland Yard, but I think he was more than that. Uh, when called in to conduct the postmortem on the body of Edmund Duff during investigations into the notorious Croydon poisoning case of 1928, Spilsbury began the proceedings by asking the other doctor present to clear his nose with a good blow. And he then, quotes Shepard, secured a strong screwdriver and prized open the lid of the coffin and said, give a sniff. This we did simultaneously. And standing up, Spilsbury said one word. (laughs) Arsenic. <laughs> there was no delay, no hesitation in saying the incriminating word. But that is something, you know, and this is, you know, evidence that, well, it can't be documented in a way that other traditional physical evidence can. You know, taking the uh, the bullet and putting it in a a plastic bag and sealing it up or finding a fingerprint and, and showing it to all others present on the jury, for example. Um, so this is where expert testimony becomes uh, critically important as people smelled things that were uh, about them and uh, about the world around them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's take a quick break and sniff around at our sponsor, And we'll come back and continue to be On The Scent with Sherlock Holmes. When you're looking for reference material regarding the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Journal has been providing thoughtful articles since 1946. The topics range from the trifling to deep conundrums, but they all center around Sherlockian scholarship. And maybe you've been subscribing for years, or maybe you have yet to subscribe. But there's one resource that can make your research easier to do. The EBSJ. The EBSJ is an electronic copy of all the back issues of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 through 2011 in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages, spanning the old series to the new series, the Christmas annuals, all the way through 2011. It's entirely searchable, so you can find what you need in just seconds. Check out the EBSJ on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. We are back on The Scent with Sherlock Holmes. We were we were just inside the coffin with Spilsbury and uh, and Duff, well, examining the body of Duff with arsenic. Um, Bert, take us back to some of Walter Shepard's uh, observations about Sherlock Holmes and smells. <laughs> well, Shepard, of course, takes us to the sign of the four and how he employed Toby, an ugly, long-haired, lop-eared creature, half spaniel and half lurcher, brown and white in color, with a very clumsy, waddling gait. I always loved that description. And the scent Toby had to follow was in tracking Jonathan Small from Upper Norwood to Mordecai Smith's landing stage on the Thames. And that, as we mentioned, was creosote. And um, the dog first traced the creosote, of course, to a damaged barrel in a timber yard, which was <laughs> a great comic scene. But, um, you know, he soon got back on track and, and led them to a great 
junction of trails. And later in The Missing Three Quarter, Holmes laid a scent himself and he used aniseed and a different dog called Pompey. Another great description, a squat, lop-eared, white and tan dog, something between a beagle and a foxhound. And he used that in finding um, the, um, the conspicuously absent and Godfrey Staunton. Yeah, and, and those those are only the the only two detailed accounts we have of Holmes using dogs for tracking, but they're lovely. Yeah, and he he had a a monograph on using dogs for tracking if I'm not mistaken. Um you may have mentioned it in uh the missing three quarter, but here's an interesting observation because what if that creosote wasn't available in Pondicherry Lodge, you know, it, it was it was stepped in by uh, Small or by by Tonga, I think, and and Holmes was therefore able to track them to the dockyards, down to uh, Mordecai Smith's launch. Well, if they hadn't stepped in that, there would have been no way to trace them. And Holmes, of course, learned from this, and that's exactly what happened in the missing three quarter. He didn't have creosote handy. He didn't have this hack, happy accident. So he created the opportunity on his own. Now, the question might be, and I would have to go back and look at the text again. Was he naturally carrying around oil of aniseed? Was it part of his, <laughs> part of his bat utility belt, uh, where the shark repellent happens to come out at the very time Batman, uh, is dumped in the drink with a shark on his leg? I mean, one of those tongue-in-cheek moments, I guess. Yes. Well, it is a great moment. It is a great moment. Well, in a way, you know, it's a sort of a precursor to other scientific detectives like Dr. Thorndike, who followed in the 20s and the 30s by Austin Freeman. Thorndike would always carry, of course, his green canvas-covered investigation kit, which had a mini microscope and all sorts of things that he would he would take out with him. But maybe Holmes did have, you know, a small assortment. Of, of critical items with him at every time. Well, it's uh, one of those items we should go back and look at because that that's uh, certainly one of the trifles that uh, we touch on here. Yeah. And then um, Shepard points out nicely that Holmes himself occasionally impersonated. He acted in a way that reminded observers of a dog and tells us about Watson's remark or Watson's description of the search of the room in Lauriston Gardens in a study in Scarlet, where he says, as I watched him, Watson writes, I was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded, well-trained foxhound as it dashes backward and forward through the cupboard, whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent. And in Boscombe Valley Mystery, Watson says, Holmes was transformed when he was hot upon such a scent as this. His face was bent downward, his shoulders bowed, his lips compressed, and the veins stood out like whipcord in his long, sinewy neck. His nostrils seemed to dilate with a purely animal lust for the chase. A question or remark only provoked a quick, impatient snarl in reply, and he made his way along the tracks. And sometimes he would hurry on, stop dead. And once he made quite a little detour into the meadow. He ran around like a dog who was picking up a scent. He ran up and down, sometimes losing, sometimes finding the track until we were under the shadow of a great beach. And here he lay down upon his face with a little cry of satisfaction, thus abandoning the dog act right at the critical point. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. And, you know, it's interesting that we have uh, Holmes com compared – that we have Holmes compared to a uh, a dog in some of these cases because Holmes was also uh, referred to uh, in, in that feline capacity as well. Uh, he had that cat-like love of personal cleanliness. Um, so, you know, th th this household animal comparison with Holmes is interesting and particularly when you think about – if you are a pet owner, how pets love to investigate with their noses. You know, they, they don't have uh, the, the same kinds of uh, uh, 
digits that we have. They certainly don't have opposable thumbs, and therefore their their snouts, their noses, become the primary means of their investigation. So seeing Holmes uh, compared to a foxhound or a bloodhound uh, is really amusing. Mm. Well, every time I walk a dog, you know, I notice and, – and it's important to pay attention to dogs. You know, I see so many people not paying attention to the dogs they're walking. But when dogs encounter smells in their walks, you know, they are consulting the world as a message board. And to them, it's sort of like Facebook. You know, it tells them <laughs> the other dogs that are in the neighborhood and they leave behind, you know, little indications of their own presence. Yeah, and that, that's uh, that's interesting. You know, when Holmes wasn't being a dog – uh, and and he was busy, um, well, I guess tracing people in more human ways. Um, he he relied on uh, other faculties as well. So it was a wonderful mixture of all of those abilities that we see together. And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Botsman, all this fresh air will kill me.